She is currently the president and CEO of New America, a think tank and civic enterprise dedicated to renewing America in the digital age. Uh, she is professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, where I think you started your study, so you've come full circle. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, she served as director of policy planning at the State Department, the first woman to hold that position. And uh, upon leaving State Department, um, Dr. Slaughter received the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award for her work leading what was a very important uh, document and, and work at the time, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. Um, uh, she also received meritorious awards from USAID and uh, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. And prior to her government service, Dr. Slaughter was Dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs from 2002 to 2009, and also Professor of International Foreign and Comparative Law at Harvard Law School from 1994 to 2002. You'll begin to wonder how she can, has fitted all of this in, as well as writing or editing seven books, including a New World Order and the idea that is America keeping faith with our values in a dangerous world. And of course, uh, one that uh, certainly received very worldwide attention, women, men, work, and family. And I think uh, the article arising from that uh, was one of the most read articles, I think, in the history of the internet. Um, Dr. Slaughter is a contributing editor also to a number of publications, including to the Financial Times uh, and today's Financial Times, uh, an article in uh, assessing the, the aftermath of the, of the election in the US. Uh, she obviously uh, provides a lot of commentary and uh, is no stranger to all the slings and arrows of discussion on foreign policy in American uh, um, and that uh, that brings on uh, in discussions on American foreign policy. And very interestingly, and I think it's probably a prelude to the discussion today, she curates foreign policy news for over 80,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, she comes at the end of a tumultuous week uh, <laughs> in, uh, for, for, uh, for us, for, uh, uh, for America, for the world. And it's been a tumultuous and unsettling year, uh, certainly, for us here. Um, uh, we're overwhelmed, I suppose, uh, by the results of the US election and its implication for foreign and economic policy. But I think probably we have to steady ourselves and see that the world still turns. And we have to find ways to deal with, uh, uh, with the issues that are uh, uh, on hand, the bitter war in Syria, Ukraine, refugee flows, Far Eastern tensions, Middle Eastern rivalries. But what will be particularly interesting for us today is, uh, will be to hear what Dr. Slaughter uh, can outline by way of her understanding of the politics of the modern world, where foreign policy issues can no longer be dealt with uh, in isolation, but in conjunction with other forces that influence our ways of thinking. Uh, such as terrorism, crime, trade, economics, food security, etc. So we look forward to hearing how all of these influences might be brought to bear on the challenges that we face. Um, Dr. Slaughter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Talk more about Europe uh, and really about how to think about Europe in the world. You in extended uh, this invitation after an FT column that I wrote after Brexit uh, that said the uh, U United States of Europe view of Europe, uh, which was the federalist view uh, of the European Union back uh, in 1957 and, and thereafter, uh, is uh, certainly battered, if not broken, uh, but that that was perhaps the wrong way to think about the European Union, uh, and the Brexit accompanied uh, the issue, the issuance of the European Strategic uh, Report uh, that Federica Mogherini undertook, and that had talked about Europe, the European Union, as a cooperative regional order, and that as a proto-federal state, the EU is going backwards, but as a cooperative regional order, it is still by far the most successful example in the world. And I argued further that the United States, or the fe a federal state, was the answer to how to achieve democracy at scale 
in the 18th century. That's the Federalist Papers. That's, of course, many of the, of the, the Enlightenment uh, writers. Uh, and that was a, a method that worked very well for the United States, for other federal states uh, around the world. But that today, the question is how to weld sovereign na nations together with their different cultures and their different languages and a reserve of powers they will not surrender. How do you unite them in such a way that you get the benefits of pooled sovereignty, uh, but uh, still allow democracy to operate across that realm? And that the answer to that question, is uh, that is the question that I think the EU is trying to answer. So that's the starting point. But I want to explain how I get to that thinking. And I want to give you a way of looking at the world that I think helps you analyze the European Union or indeed many other things uh, quite differently than we traditionally do. And I will just say, I'm going to talk about the chessboard and the web. This is uh, a, a concept I introduced in an article I've just published in Foreign Affairs uh, a month ago, uh, looking at a grand strategy, which I have to say might have been adopted in a Clinton administration, very unlikely to be adopted now, but we write for the longer term. Uh, and it is a book that I have coming out uh, in, in uh, uh, March uh, on how to think about the world, not only as the chessboard and the web. So let me start with two examples and give you the chessboard view and the web view. Uh, I'm going to look first at Ukraine and then at Syria, just as two very current uh, and continuing hotspots uh, in global affairs. So if we think about Ukraine, the classic way that I think many of us, and by us I mean those of us who are foreign policy professionals, experts, uh, maybe even uh, enthusiastic amateurs, but nevertheless, we have been taught to think about the world in chessboard terms. Right? This is just classic Westphalian uh, analysis. Essentially, you think about a world of great powers, and you think about, well, if I do this, they'll do that. Um, sometimes it's chess, sometimes it's poker. Uh, it is always a game among a certain number of powers, and indeed, we teach it now in terms of game theory. Uh, and certainly in the 20th century, that was the great way that the United States always thought about its relations with the Soviet Union. But even if you think about US-China relations or EU-China relations or relations with Iran, you're thinking about a chessboard or a poker set. Um, so if you think about Ukraine from that point of view, it looks like yet another great European uh, East-West tug of war. The origins are either, depending on which view you believe, the decision of the Ukrainians to opt for the EU over the Russian economic space, or the expansion of NATO and the Russian, uh, what that triggered in Russia. But in either case, you're seeing that on the geopolitical chessboard, Ukraine in the middle, but having triggered uh, these larger forces. Uh, and you think then of the response as very much Putin's aggression and what is the West, uh, NATO, the EU, uh, the United States going to do about it. And that is not an irrelevant set of calculations. Everything I say today is both and, not either or. You'd be crazy if you were thinking about this not to think about what Putin wanted, uh, not to think about the, to what it means for NATO, what it means for uh, the West uh, versus Russia. But the way I would also look at it would be quite different. So that's the chessboard view. Here's the web view. I would start with the Ukrainian people. And I would argue they were less focused on the EU versus Russia than they were on getting rid of corruption and having a decent state. This is, after all, the second time they've tried to do this. And the first time in the Orange Revolution was not about the EU. It was about getting rid of a corrupt government. And this second time, yes, they did not, they wanted to, to, to continue negotiating with the EU, but on the premise that the EU was their best shot of getting a decent government. And could you have given them a decent government without joining either side? They'd have taken that. That wasn't necessarily on offer, but it's really important to remember that what they wanted was looking west and looking east to governments that functioned, the ones that functioned more uh, in the, on the western side, that's what they want. 
That's the first point. The second, so that's the, just the desires of people and people looking around the world at other people and seeing a better standard of living and, and opting for it. The second, of course, is trade flows. Now here I will take a, a ethnocentric perspective. The United States, of course, initially started with John Kerry thinking, well, we're going to, I'm going to resolve this with Sergei Lavrov. Uh, this is a, you know, east-west matter, this is NATO, this is me, this is me and the Russians. Well, the United States has uh, 30 billion of trade with Russia every year, and the EU has 300 billion. Right? If you wanted to look at who was going to have any power in that setting, it was not going to be the United States. It was going to be the EU, and ultimately, with the Minsk negotiations, I think we got there. I mean, actually, the United States backed off, or, or the Europeans insisted, whichever way you want to play it. But if you were thinking about flows among people in the web perspective, you'd have to be thinking about trade flows from the beginning, and you'd have to understand where the balance of power lay. The final thing that you'd want to be thinking about are digital flows. You'd want, it's harder to remember now, but in 2011, you will recall there were very strong demonstrations against Putin in Moscow. Uh, he was very frightened by those demonstrations and has done a great deal since uh, to, to crush them. Uh, when the Ukrainians first, when they, they uh, struck, uh, demonstrated on the Maidan, they had tremendous close ties with their Russian fellow dissidents. If you track their digital relationships, there's a the you know a dissident uh, ties across uh, th through digital flows. Essentially, they, that is how they communicate. I mean, then that's also how they communicate uh, with their followers, through blogs, through Facebook, through social media generally. Putin was terrified that if those dissidents won, they were showing Russian dissidents what could be done, which again is not an East-West issue. It's a matter of Russian politics. So from the chessboard perspective, you get a geopolitical set of calculations. From the web perspective, the world of networks, of networks of people, economic networks, digital flows, you got a different set of calculations that gave, you, gave rise to a different set of policy prescriptions in terms of who should lead, how hard you push on trade, and how you then really the, the most important thing you could do is to build up the Ukrainian government. So that's one example. Let's turn to Syria. <laughs> um, and I think the one thing I'm fairly certain of at this point uh, with Trump's election is that um, this, is, this will be the end of, the Uni of US support for anything other than cutting a deal with Bashar al-Assad's government and Russia. I'm not sure that deal will hold, but I'm sure we will now try for it uh, and essentially say whatever happens in Syria is not important. What matters is ISIS will cut the deal, will fight ISIS, and will leave the Syrians to their fate. Again, I'm not certain that deal will hold, but we can talk about that in the question period. But it, again, if you look at Syria, when the Syrian civil war started, it was not unreasonable for Barack Obama to do exactly uh, what uh, James Baker did in the Balkan Wars in 1992 or 1991 and say, we don't have a dog in that fight. If you looked at it, Israel was okay. Uh, the, the, the Turkey uh, was supporting the opposition, so was Saudi Arabia, but it wasn't anything that was going to directly affect the United States. Uh, where and, and of course, above all, from the president's point of view, he wanted troops out of the Middle East, not to get involved in the Middle East. And he could look at it and say, this can be contained. We are not going to stick our necks out, just exactly as we initially thought uh, in the Balkans. Uh, and then you could further look and say, uh, you know, his priority was Iran which is not an unreasonable priority in terms of, again, thinking about geopolitics, thinking about a nuclear Iran. Uh, it, it's greatly debated as to what, to what extent actually our greater action in, in Syria would have derailed those talks, but it was a reasonable calculation uh, to make. Uh, and so thinking about it geopolitically, you, you looked at sort of the great power configuration, you wanted to continue relations with Iran, uh, and otherwise, as long as our allies in the region were okay, you didn't want to act. Now look at it from the web perspective. 
The first thing actually you'd look at, which very few people do, is the impact of climate change on the Syrian uh, uh, revolution. The understanding that because of a five-year drought, you'd had massive movements into the cities. You have a city, a country of 22 million people. The, the, the land cannot support those people in general, but certainly not after the weather they'd had. And of course, that drought played a role throughout the Arab Spring, raising food prices, uh, and that was part of the unrest but particularly acute in Syria. So just to start with, you, if you're thinking about flows and you're thinking about connections, you'd have looked at the, at the impact of climate flows uh, on, the, on that uh, region and seen it's not just political, or it's political, but it has deeper roots. But you'd have also looked at refugees, resentment, and recruitment. So refugees were not hard to predict, and many of us were predicting that, you know, it, once, that it was clear from the beginning that he would do, that Assad would do anything to stay in power. This is a this is a, a crisis that began with torturing children in Dara, and after six months of nonviolent protests where he was shooting into the crowds, uh, then of course being willing to use chemical weapons, and, and earlier than the United States actually recognized, it was clear he would rather destroy his country than give up power, and that and then it was equally clear that you would have massive refugee flows, at least in the region. I'm not sure any of us predicted what would then happen uh, in Europe, but you certainly could see it was gonna destabilize the region. You could also see you're just breeding another generation of ISIS recruits or Al-Qaeda recruits or whatever the, mo the manifestation of uh, extremist Islam is in the next generation, you've got a whole another generation of young people who see the United States as standing for those values but not being willing to do a thing when it actually came to helping them. So you're, you're incubating, as we have done already in refugee camps, another generation uh, of uh, terrorist sympathizers, if not actual uh, terrorists. And finally, of course, recruitment. Again, looking at flows, the people who are looking at social media knew that you had a far easier way to recruit across the Middle East, given what ISIL learned from Al Qaeda uh, in the digital world. And again, thinking about the patterns of digital flows. So if you'd looked at that, and many of us did, you could see that although geopolitically, we might not have had a dog in that fight, Certainly from the web perspective, when you think about non-state threats, when you think about refugees, when you think about destabilization, and again, if you map the digital world, you could see growing forces that would have caused, should have caused us to go, to go into uh, Syria. All right, so those are two examples. Let me just give you then sort of the, the broader way of, of, of the chessboard and the web, and then I want to come back to how that means we might think about Europe. Uh, and my point here is the title of, the, of this talk is Hotspots and Blind Spots. The chessboard shows you the hotspots. That's what we still focus on all the time. When you apply the lens of the web, you actually see different things that we don't tend to read about, but that give you a different set of policy choices. But you can also see crises uh, coming. And I'll just keep, throw out one, Venezuela right now. From a geopolitical point of view, that's not such a worry. We, you know, uh, Vene Chavez himself has fallen. Cuba looks different. It, it doesn't look like a, that great a threat. From a web perspective, it's a disaster. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the Caribbean is like the Mediterranean of old. It is one, ent one cultural and, and uh, uh, linguistic uh, entity, and we're going to have massive refugees. And you've got climate problems. You've got, you've got drug problems. So just to give you an example of how to think about it. The chessboard, we know how to think about. The web, as I said, is it's think about the World Wide Web. It is the networked world. It is world of criminal networks. That we're used to thinking about. We're used to thinking about terrorist networks and arms traffickers and drugs traffickers and money launderers, that world. Of course, the world of global business, networked supply chains, uh, which again, if, from an economic point of view, we're used, more used to thinking about. It's the world of civic networks, everything from NGOs uh, to organizations like this one to think tanks, uh, obviously, uh, but also universities, uh, churches, all the, the civic players who, again, have, gone, have been globalized uh, and have tremendous power. If you think about the Paris Agreement, uh, 
regardless of what the United States does as a government, the 7,000 cities that were part of that agreement and the many businesses that were part of that agreement, they will still make their commitments. That's not to say that it is not a, a, a grave setback, but it's not the same setback that it would have been if it were just a treaty on the freedom of the seas. It is a treaty that engages global networks. Thinking about the, the web, we have to think about how to build str networks strategically and how to activate them. And in the actual book, I, I take network theory and I have categories of different networks and how you would actually build them and deploy them and lead them because our, our tools are still chessboard tools. We don't have uh, web tools in, in the way uh, that, that we need them. Um, the other thing to say about the chessboard view, McKinsey has a connectedness index which actually maps how connected different countries are in terms of trade in goods and services, finance, uh, data, and people, uh, and digital. That's the, the last one. So again, there, th this is a, a outlook uh, that people are adopting and starting to measure power in terms of connectedness. So that brings me back to the EU. From the point of view of a networked entity, the EU is preeminent in the world. I mean, the EU's power after the fall of the wall was not just the attraction of being part of the West, it was the actual integration of all those countries' officials into the EU networks, the agriculture ministers, the finance ministers, the environment ministers, the justice ministers, and lots of, of, of course, networks in business uh, and civil society and, and education uh, as well. So if you think of the EU not as an entity that is trying to be a, a unitary state great power in the world, other than, than economically, not as an entity that is going to have one army. I think that's a long way away. You know, the, No one's ever been willing to cede military power to the UN. Uh, I don't see ceding it to Brussels, although I see coordinated action in many ways. But if you think of it as a set of networks in which different EU states can decide I'm going to be part of this network and not part of that one, although I would say there has to be a minimum number that they're parts of. You can't just be part of one or two, but you can, you can choose. Then not only is the EU extraordinarily well placed to be connected to Asia, Africa, Latin America for the Iberians and of course uh, the United States, uh, but equally, uh, equally importantly to use those networks in ways that allow you to actually mobilize power. So again, if you think of corporate networks, you think of civic networks, uh, you think of, of, of even government networks, sub-state networks, the EU offers a vision of a region that is by far the most successful of any other region. So I'm going to leave it there uh, and urge you to think about the EU this way, but to suggest that thinking about the EU this way is simply one example of a way that we're all going to have to think to live in a century that is both the world of the chessboard and the web. Thank you.